Welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Church. We are so happy that you could join us today. Let's take a look at some of the announcements for the upcoming weeks. Every Monday we dedicate to prayer and fasting as a church. Join us for corporate prayer right here at the church building from 5.30 to 7 p.m. From the 1st to the 29th of November, our We Care Ministry will be running a fill a box Christmas campaign. All you simply need to do is get a box, fill it up with a toy, coloring book and coloring pencils and bring it back to the church by the 29th of November. However, you could also make a cash donation and deposit it into the church account and make sure to reference We Care. We Care will present these items to the Children's Cancer Ward. For more information, you can contact our church office at 0811 270 And just a reminder of our men's event that is taking place on the 28th of November from 8 a.m. to 12. Some of our speakers will be Pastor Tian from Okahania, Pastor Chris and Philip. If you know a man, please make sure that you are inviting him. For more information, you can contact Shivi at 0811 44 Double two four zero, or you could simply sign up on our Facebook page. And just a reminder that we still have to adhere to our safety measures. So when attending any church event or service, please ensure to have your mask with you and wear it at all times, because your safety is our goal. And to find out more about who we are as a church or to find the latest sermons, you can visit our website at www.envintuk.org. Hello everyone and welcome once again to our online church. And this is uh, another opportunity that we've got to come into your home wherever you are in the midst of the, the times that we are in, in order to bring to you the Word of God. Uh, we've already resumed our services again at the venue, but um, we, we don't have all the services running. We do have a registration process that we're always inviting everyone to participate in, and uh, it's sort of been a, a first-come, first-served thing. But for those of you who are unable to make it, online is still a manner in which God is able to reach you by His Spirit. And so I just want to greet you all in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, emphasize one of our announcements that came up earlier concerning our men's gathering that is coming up. Uh, I just want to encourage you to please sign up as soon as possible. We also tend to have restrictions with regards to those meetings and we're running out of seats, so make sure that you register. If you don't know where to register, just, just contact the number that you'll see on the screen or the email that you see on the screen and we'll be able to get you that information. But make sure that you don't miss out as we're coming to the close of the yeah, it's so important to get a word from God as we prepare into uh, for the for the next year that's coming up as well. And then the other emphasis that we felt over the past couple of weeks is just the importance of prayer in this time, wherever you are as a family, as an individual, that you'll continue to raise the level of prayer in your life. Why? Because prayer is the delivery system that God has to bring you what you are believing him for which is consistent with the Word of God. If we do not pray, we, the Word of God says we have not because we ask not. And it's so important that we continue to stir up our hearts in that place of fellowship and prayer with God. And so uh, today we're continuing with our series called The Balance of Law, Grace and Faith. Last week we had a bit of a break because we had graduation Sunday. And so we, we, we needed to cater a little, a little bit more for the families of the graduates. But we're continuing this week with this series. In the first, in the first uh, uh, week, we spoke about the covenants of the Bible and how they affect our lives. It's so important that you go back to that message if you didn't see it. And the importance of this series is that it will revolutionize your whole relationship with God, the way that you perceive God, your boldness in how you approach God, and uh, your understanding concerning what Christ has done on the cross and how that begins to affect our lives and our futures. It's so important. Many believers have been saved for a long time, not understanding the distinction between the old and the new. 
and how Jesus has brought in a better way, a new and living way. And so today we're going to deal with the old covenant of the law specifically. We're going to go into a little bit of detail. Next week we'll deal with the cup of the new covenant. We'll explain the contrast between the old and the, and the new and explain the superiority of the new covenant. And then the last week we'll speak about living by grace through faith and how you actually navigate the new covenant in order that you have all the benefits that it brings with it. And so without further ado, let's just get into prayer and then get into the word. So Father, I thank you, Lord, that in this time that we humble ourselves and come and hear your word, Father, I thank you, Lord, that we will not just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. And I thank you that your word is living and active, and it is busy working on our hearts, working on our minds, renewing our lives of God in our lives. We thank you that you speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so today we're speaking about the old covenant of the law. Remember last week we covered a little bit about how the Bible has two parts. The first part, not last week, the, the first week of the series. The first part of the Bible termed the, the, the Old Testament is actually a mixture of the law and the prophets. And the Old Covenant itself, or the Old Testament itself, starts in Exodus, where God gives the law to Moses. And it runs all the way to the night when Jesus initiates the New Covenant, and this is in the Gospels. And he says, this is the cup of the New Covenant in my blood. And then it's sealed or activated by him going to the cross. And so uh, this is an important distinction that we have. Throughout the first part of the Bible, quote unquote, known as the Old Testament, you will see many things that might actually refer to the New Covenant. And so making that distinction is important. And the people who were under the law or under the old covenant was Israel. This old covenant of the law was not given to any other nation. This was a specific agreement that God made between him and the people of Israel through the mediator Moses on Mount Sinai through the giving of the Ten Commandments. All the other tribes on the earth known as the Gentiles are aliens to this covenant. And so we are dealing with this covenant because one, it's in the scriptures and two, it foreshadows the new. And today we're going to go through seven reasons, seven reasons why God gave the old covenant. I, I remember over the past two weeks hearing someone ask this question as we started this series. And they ask, if God knew that the, the old covenant was inferior to the new covenant, why didn't he just give us the new covenant? What is it that, why was he holding out on us? What was the purpose of giving the old covenant? If the old covenant, like the Bible says, was actually a covenant of condemnation that brought death, etc., etc., Why did God allow that to happen? And today we're going to deal with those specifically. Now it's important for you to notice, let's go here, Galatians chapter 4 from verse 4 to 5, for you to see that even the ministry of Jesus, when he came on the earth, he was born under the old covenant, not under the new. So much of the teachings and the doctrines that he was giving were emphasizing the true nature of the old covenant. And uh, this is where we pick it up, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now there's a lot here, but the key part that we should see here is that in the fullness of time, meaning when, when God's perfect timing had come, when the fullness of the word of God had been fulfilled through the prophets, Jesus was manifested. And he was born of a woman, very important to illustrate that Jesus was born as a man into the human race, born under the law because he had to fulfill the law. So that's just something to keep in mind as, as you uh, consider Jesus' ministry starting in Matthew chapter 1. That's not where the New Testament starts, although the Bible is broken up that way. The New Testament in the New Covenant starts 
at the night that Jesus is betrayed, but he's born under the old covenant, fulfilling the old covenant, and then ushering in the new. And you ask, okay, but what does it mean to fulfill? It means like paying a loan that you took from the bank. You pay all the installments, and once you have all the installments settled, what do you do? You stop paying. Right, And that's the same way. There were debts, there were certain expectations in the old covenant that had to be fulfilled. And Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He's the fulfillment of the old covenant. And then he brings the better covenant. Now, the seven reasons, I'm going to just summarize them for you here, and then we'll go into each one. The first one, the reasons why the law was given. The first one is because of trespasses. Or sins. Trespasses are you know what's wrong and you still do it. So there are there are things that God has said that this is wrong and this is right. And trespasses are when you cross the line and you sin in that way. So because of trespasses for restraint until Christ was manifested. Reason number two: to expose sin as exceedingly evil and deadly. Reason number three. As a schoolmaster, the law was given as a schoolmaster or a teacher to bring us to Christ, to train us unto Christ. Number four, to stop every mouth and every kind of self-justification. Where people try and explain away their sin, the law was given to stop every mouth. Number five, to make or reveal all people to be guilty before God. Number six, as a shadow and metaphor of the realities in Christ. If you look at the law and the practices of the law and the sacrificial system that was given, you will see many of them are foreshadowing Christ, and we'll, we'll go in detail into that. Then number seven, to distinguish Israel as a nation from all other nations. All right, let's get into this. Number one reason why the law was given is because of trespasses, and it, it was a restraining force until Christ was manifested. I'm reading here from Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 through to 26. It says, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed capital letter to whom the promise referred had come. That seed is Jesus. The law was given through angels entrusted to a mediator. That mediator was Moses. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Verse 21. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Verse 22, but scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So this is what happens. At the fall, in the beginning, Adam and Eve sin against God through the temptation of Satan. And that is where sin enters in and death enters in and death begins to reign. And at that time, there was not much knowledge of sin. And sin, because there was no knowledge, there was no condemnation, there was no immediate result or understanding that this is what's causing and leading to destruction, that, that meant that sin had its free reign of destruction without any restraint. And so the law was given in order to restrain trans uh, transgressions, particularly among the nation of Israel that God had picked in order to bring uh, Jesus through that bloodline. Amen? So number one, the law was given because of transgressions as a restraint until Christ, until the seed came. Number two, to expose sin as exceedingly evil and deadly. Romans chapter 7 Verse 7 to 13, it says, Therefore, what are we to say? That the Torah or the law is sinful? Heaven forbid. Rather, the function of the Torah of the law was that without it, I would not have known what sin is. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying, that the law basically exposes and reveals and tells us what sin is. For example, he says, I would not have become conscious of what greed is 
if the Torah or the law had not said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, worked in me all kinds of evil desires. This is amazing. It says that sin, using the law, worked in me all kinds of evil desires. And then it says, for apart from Torah or for, uh, apart from the law, sin is dead. Verse 9. I was alive once outside the framework of the law or of the Torah. But when the commandment really encountered me, sin sprang to life and I died. The commandment that was intended to bring me life was found to be bringing me death. Verse 11, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment, sin killed me. Verse 12, so the Torah is holy or the law is holy, that is the commandment is holy, just and good. Verse 13, then did, then did something good become for me the source of death? This is the question. So he's saying the law is good. God gave the law to teach us what sin was because when the law entered in, then the consequences of sin became apparent. And then he says, then was something that was meant to be good, did that then result in my death? Then did something good become for me the source of death? Heaven forbid, rather it was sin working death in me through something good so that sin might be clearly exposed as sin, so that sin through the commandment might become the experience, might come to be experienced as sinful beyond measure. So the commandment highlights, highlights the evil nature of sin in that sin even takes advantage of the law and uses it to bring condemnation and death. So this is Number re reason number two, Romans 7, why the commandment was given is so that it exposes sin for what it is. Reason number three, Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 through to 26. The law was given as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, as a schoolmaster unto Christ as a tutor or a guardian. Let's read here Galatians 3.24. It says, in other words, the law was our guardian, our child minder, or our tutor, an attendant or slave who watched over a child in a wealthy Greco-Roman household, leading us to or until Christ so that we could be made right with God, declared righteous and justified through faith. All right. So this is what it says. It says that the law was playing the role of a tutor, not to lead us to the law, but to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified through faith. Verse 25. Now the way of faith or faith has come and we no longer live under a guardian or a tutor. So he says here that now that faith has come, now that faith in Christ has come, we are no longer under the tutor. Who's the tutor? The law. We are no longer under the Torah. We are no longer under the tutor. And he's saying specifically this to the Jewish people because all the other nations had no law. <laughs> they had no law. They had no tutor. Right? But the law, the purpose of the law was to point to Jesus, to show them their need for a savior, to point them and draw them as a teacher would draw children to, to a certain point, to draw them to Christ. Verse 26, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Or in Christ Jesus, you are all children or sons of God through faith. So that's reason number three, that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law was giving us the beatings that we needed so that we could now begin to avoid the law and the law was pushing us towards Christ so that we could find our safety in the arms of the teacher of all teachers, so to speak. Then reason number four as to why God gave the, co the covenant of the law to stop every mouth 
and every kind of self-justification. You know, there's a lot of people that you meet, you ask them, are you a good person? And everyone, usually everyone, even the criminals will say, yeah, I'm a good person. I make some mistakes here or there, but in my heart, I'm actually very, very good. And when you begin to take them through the commandments to see whether the commandments have been kept by them 100%, that is when you will begin to notice that the law begins to make a man quiet and he takes away all his excuses. This was the purpose of the law. Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says, Now we know that whatever the Lord says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that the murmurs and excuses of every mouth may be hushed and all the world may be held accountable and guilty to God. For no one, verse 20, for no person will be justified, made righteous, acquitted, and judged acceptable in his sight by observing the works prescribed by the law. For the real function of the law is to make men recognize and be conscious of sin, not mere perception, but an acquaintance with sin that works towards repentance, faith, and holy character. This is what Romans says. He says that you who are trying to be justified by the law, you are missing the point because there's no justification in the law. The law must show you that you have the disease, but you don't go to the law to get cured. You go to the physician for the cure. Amen. And so it's like somebody that you take to the hospital and there's a massive needle that they have to inoculate them with for the cure of their disease. Before you give them that cure, you must first explain how the disease works and what will happen and this will fall off, that will fall off, and then the pain will... Then, once they are already full of the conviction of this disease and they're persuaded, they will easily take the syringe. Most people, and there are still some brothers who will cry, but most people will take it desperately. In the same way, the law is to take away every man that says, I'm a good person. Liar. Liar. How many lies have you told in your whole life? We claim to be good people, and yet we deceive and we lie in our motives. And God's expectation is perfection. Not only goodness on the outside, but goodness even on the inside. Now let's look here at Romans chapter 2. Verse 12, I'm just going to sort of fly over concerning that. And he basically explains here about how God's impartial judgment works. Because people ask, yeah, but what about people that are in the jungles and they've never heard the law and they don't have that coming to them, explaining to them what sin is and all. How does that work? Now, this is what Romans says. He says, everyone who sinned outside the law, you see, will be judged outside the law. And those who sinned from within the law will be judged by means of the law. After all, it isn't, after all, it isn't, hmm? after all, isn't those who hear the law, it isn't those who hear the law who are right before God. It is those who do, who do, excuse me, it's those who do the law who will be declared to be right in his sight, okay? And then verse 14 says, this is how it works out. Gentiles don't possess the Lord, and we are Gentiles, as their birthright. But whenever they do what the law says, they are a law for themselves, despite not possessing the law. They show that the works of the law is written in their hearts, in their conscience bears witness as well, and their thoughts will run this way and that way, sometimes accusing them and sometimes excusing them. On that day, on the day when according to the gospel I proclaim God judges all human secrets through, uh, through King Jesus. And it's very important that you understand this, that there is a law inside of our conscience. We are not like animals. We are not like beasts that don't know right from wrong. People will say, yeah, it's fine to do this. It's because their conscience has been seared. But it's so important that you understand that even if you are not Jewish and you don't have the law and the commandments, there is a law that is inside your heart that tells you what you're doing is not right. And that conviction is also supposed to draw you to Jesus Christ. So this is very important. In order for us to understand the purpose of why the, the Old Testament is being emphasized, it makes room, it justifies, it explains the coming of Christ. 
as the solution for the problem that comes in the Old Testament. So this is very important, and most people don't understand this, but it's very plain from the Scriptures. All right, so that's reason number four. Reason number five, there's going to have two parts here. The, the law was given to make and reveal everyone guilty before God. And you will see how Jesus used this in the New Testament. I'm going to read here from Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. And most of the time he's speaking here to people who know the law. It's a Jewish environment. It's people who know the law. And many of them are Pharisees, so they study the law. They are the ones who are perfectionists when it comes to fulfilling the law. It says, verse 18, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law, till all is fulfilled. And then verse 19, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus doing here? He's elevating the law. Not so that people can try and keep and keep and keep, because he here says that you have to exceed that of the Pharisees. And they were the ones who were keeping the best, tithing on every little thing and trying to wear the right clothes and everything. And so it's very important that you see here the ministry of Jesus under the law, elevating the law and him then going to fulfill it. Verse 21 says, you have heard it said, of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, or another version says, of hell fire. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, or fool, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. Be first, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Verse 25. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say, to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And so Jesus here is speaking to people who thought they were fine. Oh, I, I'm not a murderer. I'm not, I'm not like calling my brother insults. I'm just calling him a fool. I'm just, I'm just angry. And Jesus is saying, even those people, all of them need to make right before they come to worship God. And he's elevating the law so that everyone can become desperate before God and say, what, what, who shall help us then? Who shall help us then? Look here at this one. Most of the guys and, and even ladies will struggle with this one. Matthew chapter 5, verse 25. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable that you, for you that one of your members perish, one of your body parts perish, than for your whole body to be cast into hell. These are the words of the loving Jesus. <laughs> and then it says, if and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members or body parts perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. What is Jesus saying here? Is he saying, therefore, that now everybody must make sure that if you look at a woman with lust, pluck your eye out, and if you've done something wrong with your hand or your arm, then cut it off? Is that what Jesus is saying? No. Who can, who can meet that standard? Without Christ, without the Holy Spirit, who can meet that standard? 
And this was the issue. The Jewish men, the Pharisee, the Sadducee, they felt that, no, I'm not committing adultery. They would even bring people who commit adultery to Jesus for stoning. And Jesus said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And all of them walked away. There is none righteous. No, not one. All of us have gone astray. All of us like sheep have each followed his own way. And all of us need our iniquities and our transgressions laid upon, the, upon Jesus. This is the, the purpose of the law is to make and reveal all your guilt before God. This is why the law is not the way to access to the throne of God. It's not. It is to exclude. To exclude you. This is how the law operated. All right, let's go to reason number six. It was given as a shadow and a metaphor of the realities in Christ. And for those of you who are doing many of the Old Testament practices, feeling like, no, that's what Jesus wants you to do. Let's read here and see what it says. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 to 4. It says, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would not have stopped being offered, for the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins, and it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So he says here, the law was a shadow. The things that were done under the covenant of the law were by an icon of what Christ was going to come and fulfill. Now imagine you're in a long distance relationship or your wife or husband has traveled and you have to deal with her picture and you're only dealing through, through messages and that kind of thing. It's fine at that point to kiss the picture and to sort of embrace the picture. But once that person comes back from their trip and you start to embrace the picture, that will cause problems in the relationship. <laughs> And so it's very important that you understand that Christ has come. The picture was the Old Testament showing, foreshadowing what Christ was to fulfill. Let's look here at Colossians chapter 2 verse 16. It says the same thing. It says, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. This is awesome. And it, it shows us how we should read the Old Testament. We should read it with that eye to say, oh, wow, here's Jesus being portrayed. Oh, wow, there's Jesus being portrayed. Oh, wow, there's Jesus being portrayed. And that revelation, it begins to enhance our appreciation for what Christ is doing even in the New Testament in the new covenant. Hallelujah. Then reason number seven. The last reason, one of the final reasons why, an important reason why the law was given was to distinguish Israel from other nations. Now I must say this, there might be other reasons that you know about why the law was given. I'm just capturing these major seven. Okay, it says here it was to distinguish Israel from all other nations. Exodus Chapter 19, verse 5. Now, if this is God speaking, and he says, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Out of all nations, do you see? If you keep my covenant, if you do what I say, if you fulfill this covenant, you will be special to me among all nations. And then it says, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. God speaking to Moses. So um, the, the law consisted not only of the Ten Commandments, but also had other 600 um, uh, ordinances, 630 I believe, 
ordinances which relate, related to civic life, which related to religious life, which related to, to judicial life. And then you had the moral uh, code, which was the Ten Commandments. And then you had the principles of how, uh, how things were supposed to be done in terms of uh, which tribe does the priesthood come from. And then the sacrificial system that God instituted in order to sort of make them escape the curses of the of the uh, covenant so israel today is actually still enjoying some of this distinction because of the prophecies that were spoken through the prophets concerning natural israel for those of you who don't like natural israel god chose them <laughs> it was like esau and jacob jacob i loved and so it, and jacob's name is israel that was just god's choice he gave them the law and the way they lived Following the law made them very peculiar and different from the other nations. The other nations worshipped all kinds of the rocks and all kinds of moon and sun and all. They didn't. The other nations ate everything that, that walks and crawls and all. They didn't. They had a special meals, a special way of worshipping, special way. They even had the circumcision situation. Right? They had the quarantine. They, there were so many things that when you became part of Israel, you were very unique. In their culture, it was to distinguish them so that God, through the, uh, through the line of Israel, could bring the Messiah. The whole thing was not so that they could be special on their own. It's, they were made special for the purpose of Christ coming through them so that a blessing could go to all the nations. So these are the seven reasons why the law was given. There might be more, but these are major ones. Firstly, because of trespasses to restrain sin until Christ came, especially in Israel. Then two, to expose sin as exceedingly evil and deadly. Three, as a schoolmaster unto Christ. Four, to stop every mouth and self-justification, making excuses. Five, to make and reveal all people as guilty before God, even those who think, no, I've lived a perfect life and I'm a good person. Six, as a shadow and metaphor of the realities in Christ. And seven, to distinguish Israel from all the other nations. Now, the second question that we're going to deal and conclude is this. Is the old covenant of the law useful and relevant for us today? Especially, look at the Ten Commandments. You know, what is the use? Is there any relevance? Now, Timothy answers it, or Paul answers it when he writes to Timothy. I'm going to read here for you. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. It says, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Some people have strayed from these things and have turned aside to fruitless discussions, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Verse 8, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. This is the apostle of grace saying to Timothy that there's a lawful use of the law. Realizing, verse 9, number 1, realizing that the fact, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and worldly, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, homosexuals, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So this is what he says. He says that the law should only be addressed to those who don't have Christ. Because the assumption is this, that once you have Christ, the fruit of the Spirit begins to flow in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And so, and he says against this, there is no law. But when you're speaking to people who don't know what sin is, don't know what right and wrong is, or they dispute it. They say, no, I don't believe in that. I come from a culture where we eat each other, we kill each other. It's fine to do this. Adultery is our culture. You know, murder is my culture. Lying is my culture. Coveting, uh, idolatry is my culture. When the law comes up, the voice inside of the conscience will say, yeah, that is right. 
And then once they have that experience, then they will desire and say, but I can't keep this. And then you say, well, I've got good news for you. And this is what we're going to address next week when we deal with the New Testament. Now, why are we dealing with this? What's so important about this? This is the settlement of the issue. Everything in relation to God, from God's side, was for relationship with us. His desire was always to be with mankind. Relationship with you. God desires a genuine, almighty God desires a genuine relationship, a loving, wonderful relationship with you and with me. But sin entered in, and the word of God says that sin separated us from God. Sin entered in and began to destroy the holy relationship that we have. And God made a way through Christ, and he brought in the law first, as a shadow to restrain things and to try and bring Israel because he couldn't make a way without bringing another man, a second Adam in, to reverse what the first Adam had done. And then the Old Testament was a temporary thing because that was a, a, a covenant where you couldn't, you couldn't have relationship with God. It was only Moses and the high priest and some special people, the rest of us here at the back. Give them the money, give them the access, and they do it on behalf of us. Like many people are pursuing all sorts of men of God in that fashion. But God's heart was always to open the way fully so that everyone who would come could go fully into the, not just into the outer court of the temple, not just into the holy place of the temple, but into the holiest Holy of holies, where God's presence is, to the point where under the new covenant, he says, I will no longer have a temple because I, you, I've made you so holy that I can live inside of you. Hallelujah. And so this is God's heart. Closeness, fellowship, proximity, intimacy with man. Him in us. We in him. This is the plan. And if you are under the law, you can never experience that. And so the law has done its work. For those of you who are not born again, let the law speak to you and say you are not a good person. There will be consequences for you. Death is the wages of sin. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so next week, we're going to deal specifically with the new covenant. I want to pray for us today. If you're not born again, Receive Christ today. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, forsake your self-righteousness. If you think you're a good person without Christ, forsake that. Put all your, all your faith, all your eggs in that basket like a parachute one, one time and you're jumping into eternal life. And so, Father, I pray today for your sons and daughters, for those who are listening. Father, I pray that this revelation will become so clear for your people, that they will understand that the covenant of the law was a temporary inferior covenant in order to prepare the way for Jesus, but that they will begin to see Christ even through that, Lord. I pray for every person that struggles with guilt and condemnation, even when they go to church and everything. Father, that that will begin to lift off their lives today in Jesus' name, as they begin to understand that Jesus has made a new and living way. I pray a blessing over your people in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll meet you again. If you're joining us in the service, we look forward to seeing you. But otherwise, we'll see you online. Please remember to subscribe. If you have anybody that needs to have this information, forward this to them, send it on to them, and we will see you soon. God bless. Thank you for listening. For more information about this podcast and other resources, please visit envintook.org.